Adam has dropped in theaters, so today we're gonna stop and rank every DCEU hero from the worst to the best. As we go into this, I didn't include the Suicide Squad because while they are the protagonist of their films, they're only doing the right thing because they don't want to die. There's also like over 20 of them, so that would make this list very cumbersome. And I have my own video talking about the Suicide Squad. One more thing before we get started, this video is brought to you by Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. I don't know about you, but for me, the fall is an incredibly busy season. That's where Factor comes in. Their zero prep, zero mess meals make it so easy to have fast, delicious meals that can fit anyone's lifestyle. Factor makes wholesome eating simple. They offer a variety of meal plans with rotating weekly menus of 25 plus meal options and they have factor plus add-ons choose your favorite meals or let factor craft your orders based on your taste preferences and meal history i've been using factor for about six months now and i just keep track of my favorites each month so when i'm ordering i'm able to order from my list of favorites so tonight's meal is the buffalo chicken breast one of my favorites from factor if you don't know i'm pretty into fitness and pay close attention to what i eat but i don't really know how to cook so Factor brings variety to my diet while still meeting my nutrition goals, while still tasting great and being quick and easy to prepare. We're updating our kitchen right now so I can't sit at the kitchen table, but the food tastes just as good over here. Head to go.factor75.com slash SeanChandler60 and use code SeanChandler60 to get 60% off your first Factor box. The link is down below in the description and let's get started. In last place, the Huntress, one of our birds of prey. And the idea of the character is pretty good. She has a backstory giving her a nice motivation that's clear. I like the actress playing the character, but I don't think the mashup of the two worked for me. I simply didn't find her convincing as this character. Not impressed. And a lot of the parts where she's supposed to be intense and the person out for revenge, it just felt like she was overcooking it. And actually it's one of the, probably the my least favorite performance I've, I've ever seen her in. And it's the only one that I've seen where I was like, I don't think that really worked. And so for me, a matchup of actress character that didn't come together, there's potential here. I didn't really see it in Birds of Prey. Number 23, Montoya, another one of our Birds of Prey. And she's fine, but it's just kind of like a, a stock character. The hard-boiled cop on the case that gets too dedicated. They get in trouble for committing themselves too hard, so they take the law into their own hands. It's an action movie cliche. That's kind of what makes it a little bit fun in the movie to have that play into a superhero story where you have someone that is kind of the classic superhero out for revenge. You have someone like Harley Quinn that is absolutely not in any way a traditional hero. And then you have the hard-boiled cop joining in. I mean, it's fun to mix it all together like that. But as a standalone character, it's just kind of like, okay, yeah, I mean, that fit the story, but... I don't care about her all that much as an individual character. Next up, Cyclone from the Justice Society in Black Adam. And I, I didn't dislike the character. I thought she was fine in the movie. There's just not much there for her. She's not given enough time to have a clear backstory, motivation. She's just someone with, like, wind powers. So she gets to join in on the action. She has some nice camaraderie with her teammates, but of the characters in that movie, I felt like she was the one given the least amount of time to be interesting. And so you're just kind of left with kind of knowing her personality, kind of knowing her skill set. And that's about it. And so I can't really have her pre any higher on the list. Number 21, Black Canary of our Birds of Prey. And much like Montoya, I, I don't have any issues with the character in particular. I don't have a problem with the performance. There's moments in there that are kind of fun. And I feel the team works. I'm a defender of the movie Birds of Prey, but the individual characters outside of Harley Quinn don't really pop that much. They're, they're not that interesting. They just kind of work together. They have some banter that's fun when they're together. As individual characters, they're not that memorable. They don't have all that clear of backstories and motivations that 
just kind of draw you in and want to see more about them. So once again, uh, yeah, she, she's pretty good. She has some fun fight scenes. She gets to do her shout thing <laughs> like one time in the movie where she really does her back canary siren deal. So, you know, I if there was more there, maybe she'd be higher, but there's just not much there to make her stand out. Bringing us into the top 20, we have Adam Smasher, and much like Cyclone, a character where we don't have a ton to go off of here. We know that he's kind of following in his family's footsteps, he's brand new to the role, and he's more amusing than Cyclone. He's given more funny bits, but that's like his arc is he doesn't really know what he's doing and he keeps accidentally slapping people. So he's funny. He stands out more for that reason. But once again, the movie for what it's trying to do is not trying to have these deep characters and he's not on the top of the list for that matter. And so he's just kind of kind of there to add some comic relief. He does that well. And that's about it. Number 19, Rick Flagg. And to be perfectly honest, from here on out, this is a really tricky list for me because there's a lot of fun characters and I want everybody to be higher up, but not everybody has a personality that pops. Not everybody's given a compelling character arc. And so it gets tricky and you get to Rick Flagg. And after the Suicide Squad, I actually really liked Rick Flagg. I I'd love to get more time with Rick Flagg, which will be difficult to do after what happens in the movie The Suicide Squad, but he's introduced in uh, the first Suicide Squad film and pretty dull, love-struck, serious dude, comes back, he gets James Gunnified in The Suicide Squad, but more importantly, he's kind of given time with these characters, and so he has, like, rapport with them. And there's just something fun about watching where he was at the beginning of the first film to kind of the rapport that he has with some of them in the second. Likewise, you get to a point in time where you realize this guy's not on Team Amanda Waller. Like, he might work for her, but he is not Amanda Waller. And because of that, he's willing to go against her. So a character is much improved in the second film. Still not someone with a big personality that pops. Still not someone with a big, gigantic character arc that's super compelling and has some emotional payoff to it, but fun nonetheless. Then we have Hawkman of the Justice Society from Black Adam. And I actually really enjoyed this character in the movie. Much as I've said about the other characters in the film, not a lot of backstory, not a lot of meat, but as just kind of a personality coming to head with Black Adam, I really love that alpha male like rivalry between the two of them where Hawkman knows he can't defeat Black Adam, but it doesn't stop him from doing what he believes in. And he's not afraid to die. He's on a mission and he's going to do what he has to do to succeed in that mission. And so I loved all of that. Hopefully we'll get to see more of this character and in the future get more of a backstory, more of an arc for him. So he's not just a fun personality at odds with other big personalities, but someone that really grows, changes and has some emotional depth. Number 17, the Polka Dot Man. Now, in my introduction, I did say I wasn't going to include the Suicide Squad because they're only doing the right thing because they're being forced to. But as you move into the third act of The Suicide Squad, it reaches a point in time where Amanda Waller orders them to stand down and threatens to kill them if they don't stand down. And a group of the members of the team decide to go against Amanda Waller know that Amanda Waller will kill them for doing this, and they decide to battle Starro, this kaiju attacking this town, because it's the right thing to do, and they have to use their abilities to try and save these people, in which case they move from villains being forced into being anti-heroes to save the day, to being something new entirely. I'm a superhero! And that brings us to the Polka Dot Man. What a weird character. When I saw the trailer, I was like, I don't know what James Gunn is doing here, but James Gunn did his magic and he's just so good at taking weird, weird characters and finding the humanity inside of them. And in the case of Polka Dot Man, you have this character who was like experimented on by his mother to turn him into a superhero, which turns him essentially into this monster that can't control his powers, thus turning him into a villain. But because he's turned into a villain, 
He's put on the suicide squad that gives the context to where he can fulfill his mother's destiny for him and truly become I'm a superhero! It's all very James Gunn stuff. He even gets a heroic death. It's weird. I'm creeped out and weirded out when the polka dots start coming out of his face if he doesn't let them out soon enough. It's weird. It's gross. But man, James Gunn can find cool stuff even in the weirdest of characters. Number 16, Vigilante from Peacemaker. For this list, I decided to only include the suited superheroes from Peacemaker. I didn't include the entire team. Maybe I should have. These lists are tough to make and they get very, very long as soon as you start getting loose with who you decide to include. But speaking of weird, crazy characters where James Gunn can find the humanity inside of them, you get Vigilante, this character who's introduced as this total weirdo, psychopath character that is unhinged, absolutely not motivated by any of the right reasons, but sort of headed in the right direction in a Dexter sort of way. And throughout the course of the season, they're able to find like this like naive innocence and sweetness inside of an actual psychopath, an actual sociopath. And he just has this certain way that he relates to people and the way that he wants to be friends with them and be accepted by them and wants approval that makes him incredibly endearing while always having that creepy, insane side to him. And they give him just these moments where as much as he's a psycho, as much as he's a very dangerous person, they give him moments where he really gets to be this hero in different kinds of ways where he like sits down with a group of racists. What's up, fellas? But you totes seem like the coolest guys in this place. So I was thinking, you know, like we should get to know each other. It just goes off on them. Awesome, awesome stuff. <laughs> So it takes a character that at the beginning is like, where are they going with this guy? And find something cool to do with it. Number 15, Ratcatcher 2 from The Suicide Squad. Another character where when I read the description of the character before watching the movie, I was like, what are we doing here? And despite the movie having a ton of characters, all of which with have these big gigantic personalities, James Gunn's able to find just enough time to have the conversations to give just enough information and a backstory there about her father and why he chose rats and these value sets that he instills into her that kind of makes her this character that pulls people together. So she it becomes kind of the glue for the team in this mindset of like, we're gonna keep each other alive. We're gonna get each other through all of this. Let me get you out of your life. I'm going to get you out of here alone. And that sets up a scenario where she's, in a certain ways, the, the catalyst that shifts blood sports thinking just enough that creates the scenario where all of them get become heroes by the end of the movie and get included on this list. Next up, King Shark. Now I'm totally biased on this one because I love Stallone and he is voiced by Stallone, but once again, James Gunn does his magic and takes a character who is primarily in the film to be a comedic character where he has a very simple mind, simple vocabulary, are you food or are you friend? And he is impressed at the fact that he can say hand. Hand. Yes, that is your hand. Very good. They take that character, you even find a little way to give him a mini arc that has some nice payoff in there where for the first time, there's a group of people that are kind of his friends. A lot of that because of Ratcatcher 2. And he discovers that these people around him, they're not food, they're friends. And there's just something really sweet about that. And they do it with a character that sometimes, you know, eats people, sometimes rips people in half. And they give him like a, a kind of a wholesome little arc. That is what James Gunn is so good at. Doing something so crass, so hard R, and then having a sweetness to the at the center of it too. Number 13, Steve Trevor, the World War I soldier that's a big part of pulling Wonder Woman off into the affairs of mankind. And he's just written to be a real decent guy that's heroic, that is curious, and he's trying to do the right thing, and he's willing to make sacrifices to do what needs to be done. And 
there's just something about that that's really compelling. He doesn't have like a specific arc of growth and change because he's already kind of fully formed by the point in time he's brought into the story of Wonder Woman of being someone that's trying to do whatever he can do to save lives. And that brings us all the way into the finale of the film where he, he looks around and he says, well, you know, uh, I can be the hero today, but you can be the hero forever. <laughs> he makes this sacrifice. I don't remember what the exact line is, but I, I just love that little sacrifice that he does, the arc and all that it means. Then we have The Flash, a member of the Justice League who was greatly helped by Zack Snyder's Justice League. In Justice League, there just wasn't really much there. He was a superhero with incredible powers who was afraid to get into fights. See, I'm afraid of bugs. So Batman's like, yeah, just push people out of the way. And then we get to the end of the movie and it's like, push a car. So he's quirky, kind of fun, but there wasn't really much there. And then you get Zack Snyder's Justice League and they're finally able to kind of inform his backstory much more about his father, his giddiness to get involved in being a superhero, his reluctance to use certain powers because of the dangerous consequences that could come with it, all leading up to the finale where he's desperately trying to do his part in circling around the city and then he's injured. He can't use his powers like he wants to. And a moment happens where he literally, literally, while injured, goes full speed force, charging into an explosion, turning back time, rebuilding reality as he does it. So he hasn't gotten a, a big gigantic arc there. He has gotten some great moments because of Zack Snyder's Justice League. So kind of a fun, quirky personality and got one of the most epic moments in comic book movie history. Then we have Dr. Fate of the Justice Society in Black Adam. And of our Justice Society members, I feel like this is the one that was made by far the most interesting. And they don't like pause to elaborate on his backstory. They just give little moments alluding to everything that's been going on with him. Little moments where he talks about his past. Little moments where he reflects on the burden that comes with the helmet and knowing the future and seeing so much death. And so they're just able to, with just a few lines of dialogue, not a lot of screen time, flesh out a character that's very compelling. Add to that when you bring in someone like a Pierce Brosnan to play the role, it just elevates the character. It elevates the material and takes it to this whole other level of just being so engaging with what's going on. And then, of course, Dr. Fate himself just has a very cool set of powers in being able to see the future and then having uh, ability to multiply himself and create these mirages and everything. So a cool set of powers, not necessarily a full like arc, though it does kind of complete an arc with what they do with him. Just much more there than the other Justice Society members. We've made it to the top 10 with Cyborg. And once again, this is a character dramatically helped by Zack Snyder's Justice League in Justice League. He's just kind of there. You get just little glimpses of his backstory, but no real depth to be able to make his arc pay off. And then with Zack Snyder's Justice League, you have entire chapters dedicated to exploring the journey that he was on of his relationship with his father before the accident, why his father did what he did and the consequences that has on, on Cyborg himself of feeling like this monster, but with all these powers, but such powers that makes him feel distant from the rest of mankind and not knowing his place in this world anymore, what to do with being so powerful, but so disconnected at the same time. And through the journey of joining the Justice League, you get to the end of it where the box is tempting him and he realizes that's not really a temptation anymore because he knows his place. So just gave him so much more depth, so much more heart that pays off so nicely in that film. Next up, Harley Quinn, sometimes villain, sometimes honorary member of the Birds of Prey and sometimes a member of the good Suicide Squad that battles kaiju and that's kind of what makes her so much fun she's insane she's wild and crazy and she herself is not specifically motivated in a specific direction just because of her brokenness she's drawn towards other people i guess it's a codependency that she has but she's also very loyal to those people so when her friends are hurt she wants to go to their defense and when her friends have a mission she'll join in 
Sometimes that's a bad thing because it's the Joker, and sometimes it's a good thing because it's the Birds of Prey, and sometimes it means saving the city because she's with Bloodsport, who's decided to be a hero. And she's always unpredictable. She's always entertaining. Margot Robbie is obviously fully committed to the role, and that's what makes it fun. But she also has, like, like as wild as she is, she has just enough humanity in there to where... She's excited to have a sleepover with the Birds of Prey. She's sad in the finale of The Suicide Squad when she learns that one of her friends died. And it's that where she's able to just be grounded enough to have the insanity for the fun, but also have something in there that's also quite fascinating and can actually be emotional. Number eight, Peacemaker, and the greatest magic trick that James Gunn was ever able to pull off was to actually make me like Peacemaker. After the end of the Suicide Squad, I was like, why are they making a show about this guy? I hate this guy. He's the absolute worst. And then James Gunn works his magic. And then he gives him his own show, and the whole thing is showing the humanity and showing the childhood trauma that creates someone like Peacemaker that thinks he's a hero while actually being a monster and has such unbelievably contradictory thoughts in his head. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. And the way Gunn does this is, is kind of pretty obvious. They take the exact thing that made us hate him in the Suicide Squad and they actually have that affect him. Whereas it seemed like nothing really affected him in that film. You have this moment, this one line of dialogue. Peacemaker. What a joke. And then you show the aftermath of what that does to a person as, as it soaks in that, that he is a joke. He doesn't really stand for what he believes that he stands for and then they play out that redemptive arc. And you show just his unbelievably awful father created this monster that is him. And then it allows even a terrible person to have redemption. And there's something about that that's special. And they, they, they reveal a sweet side to him and an innocent side to him. This unbelievably crass character that's some terrible things, including killing Rick Flagg is given a journey where you find the humanity and is given redemption. Then we have Shazam, and this is a fun character in arc, essentially because it is the journey of the movie big, except as a superhero, where you have a child that becomes a superhero and does all the immature things you'd expect a child to do as a superhero, but then also has the responsibilities of a superhero. And there's just something about that that's very interesting. And, of course, it's an enormous amount of fun, and a big part of that is Zachary Levi, who's just great at playing man-children. And you get all of that in the first Shazam film. But then they, they also add so much heart and depth to the Billy side of the story that just elevates the whole thing to where it's not just silly fun, it also has a lot of heart to it. And this journey of becoming the superhero is a big part of finding this brand new family. Now, on that note, I decided not to include the rest of the Shazam family just yet. They will be included in next year's update of this, but that's a year and four movies away from now. We just didn't get enough of them as actual superheroes. They're just basically cameos showing up at the finale. So I decided not to include them just yet, but they're coming next year, I'm pretty sure. Number six, Black Adam, and this is just a fun addition to the mix because you have this incredibly powerful character who's kind of headed in the right direction, kind of a hero, and he's super okay with killing people. Like, super okay with killing people. And that's so much of what brings him at odds with Hawkman is that very different perspective on what you do with bad guys. Heroes don't kill people. Well, I do. Add to that The Rock playing just this overly cocky, super-powered being is an enormous amount of fun to watch. But what really pulls it together is the backstory of this character that isn't actually the right champion. 
He's not the one that was chosen by the wizards to wield this power. They're super selective and they're looking for certain qualities to be their champions. And they didn't choose him. They chose his son. And his son was the one that was supposed to free the people, the one that cared, the one that had the vision for all of it, not him. And then even his son chooses to sacrifice himself in order to save his father because his son is the hero. And Black Adam is just driven by rage and anger. There's a lot of really profound, compelling stuff in all of that. A lot of really cool stuff in there. I hope we get more of the character to kind of get, bring out more of the complexities than just kind of giving us the backstory and the persona, which is what we got in the movie. We've made it to the top five and I'm going with Bloodsport. I really dug what they did with this character. Of our Suicide Squad members, he's probably the most grounded, the most human of the bunch, where he's just a dude with a bunch of cool weapons and a daughter back home. And while, you know, he's done some bad stuff like shooting Superman, which is not something you should do, he's not a great father, but he's also not wholly just this evil, evil person. And they use the journey of this film to find all the best stuff in him and pull it out through that interaction with Ratcatcher and that just having him kind of discover that maybe he doesn't see that he's all good. But he reaches a moment in time where he has to make a choice. And am I going to choose to save myself or am I going to do the right thing and choose to save these people? Stand up to Amanda Waller, stand up to a gigantic kaiju. He doesn't have to do a lot. He doesn't have to say a lot to do some really emotionally profound stuff. We just have a moment where it pauses to show his daughter watching television. <laughs> That's my dad. And it means so much in the context of the story, just this simple line of dialogue from her of he's chosen to be the best version of himself. And I love that, that they're able to take terrible people that shoot Superman and give them redemption, find the hero inside of them. I, I loved, I loved what they did. In fourth place, Wonder Woman, a character that I wasn't really sure how they were going to adapt into live action in film in the universe that Zack Snyder started with Man of Steel, especially given some of the failed attempts in the past and all the people that couldn't pull it off and the versions that were kind of goofy. But they did it. They found a way to create this well-rounded character who's strong, confident, a warrior. At the same time, they're able to make her naive, do fish out of water comedy with her when she goes into the human world. They make her clueless in a certain sense. As wise as she is, as much insight as she has, she doesn't understand the complexities of the human world and man's inhumanity to man. And there's still a lot in that that's very compelling and interesting to me. She's someone that finds love as she discovers a man that just fully believes in his mission, is trying to do the right thing. And so just, a, just a, takes a character that there's a lot in there that's tricky to adapt into live action. And they found the way to do it and have a compelling character with an actual arc big emotions, and she would easily be in the top three, and I think Wonder Woman 1984 had to knock her back because they just did some stuff with the character and the choices they made in bringing Steve back in another person's body. I get what they're going for. It just didn't work, and it, it had issues to it that compromised the character, knocked her out of the top three. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the DCEU characters if you're up for the challenge, or who are your favorites? Who are your least favorites? I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Also, I've done a ton of other DC content. I did a real cool video a year ago where I ranked all 45 DC films from every continuity going all the way back to the 70s, uh, actually back to the 60s. And so you can check out the super cut version of that right up here when this video is over with. In third place is Aquaman. And this is just a cool and fun character. And so much of that just comes from Jason Momoa's actual personality just being so infused into the character. So he just has 
so much liveliness to him uh, when he's on screen, but also by having him as this character that by powers and by birthright has claims to being a hero, has claims to being royalty, but has rejected so much of that, they just create this interesting and compelling arc of this reluctant hero and reluctant king. So when you get to Justice League, he's not looking to join up and is only kind of slowly pulled in as he sees certain things happening um, in both worlds are dangerous. So he joins up with the team. And then as you move into the film, Aquaman, he reluctantly is pulled into this world that he believed killed off his mother, rejected him. Um, as he sees that he might be the hero that they need, not that he wants to be <laughs> in his things. And so just there's a lot of powerful, profound stuff. It's a hero's journey. It's a reluctant hero. It's a little bit of Simba. All of it fun and epic. Our runner-up, Batman. And this is always a tricky one to place because... I love Batman. He's one of my two favorite comic book characters of all time. I actually really love so much of what Ben Affleck did with the character, but we never got a Batfleck film. And we saw the character in two very odd places in his career. In Batman v Superman, it's like crazy Bruce Wayne that's flipped out because of the events of Man of Steel and he's turned into the Punisher. And then when you get to Justice League, either version, you have this... Batman, Bruce Wayne, who's in like redemptive mode that realizes I've done something terrible and I need to make it right. Now, the way they did that in Justice League would put him way lower on this list. It's just like this like very soft version of the character that's missing Batman. You can tell Ben Affleck was pissed off to have to do the reshoots. He didn't like what they were doing. So he's phoning it in. He literally looks different in the reshoots like he, he his weight was different his skin complexion was different and the performance was just not there at all and he was annoyed he's having to do these Joss Whedon jokes so he'd be way down on the list Zack Snyder's version of redemptive arc Batman does some very cool stuff where you see the strong inspiring version of the character emerge who realizes something dangerous is coming and I made a huge mistake and I cost us our greatest weapon in fighting back against that thing. I need to make this right. And you get this epic journey of him bringing everyone together and you get these little moments where his faith is restored and Alfred's like, man, I don't know if this is a great idea. Like, are you sure this is gonna work? Are you sure that Superman's gonna, gonna come? And then he turns to Alfred and he says, Faith, Alfred. And then, of course, it's a version of Batman that is the intense, vicious guy that we saw in the warehouse scene in Batman v Superman that he'll even bring that to meetings where the Flash is weird. Like, how are we supposed to battle against this army that's conquered all these worlds? He doesn't care about any of, the, any of that. I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells. He's never fought us. Not us united. So... As weird as everything has been with Warner Brothers, the Snyderverse, Batfleck leaving, he's never going to come back, he's burned out on the role, then he does some reshoots for Zack Snyder's Justice League. He's coming back for a little bit in The Flash. He's going to be in Aquaman just a little bit. Hey, there's hope that maybe we're going to get a Batfleck movie. I don't know what the chances are, how unlikely it is, but there's mild pieces of hope that maybe we could get a fleshed out version where he's in the lead in his own story. It's a far off shot that it'll ever happen. But as Batman said, He'll be here, Alfred, I know it. What makes you so sure? Faith, Alfred, faith. But coming in at number one is Superman, the other of my two favorite comic book characters of all time. My two favorites are Batman and Superman. And I, I just think that what Zack Snyder was able to do was brought Superman into the modern world that kind of took off some of the hokier aspects, added a little bit more complexity, a little bit more of a, a torn worldview of trying to figure out his place in this world as someone that is an outsider that is super powerful and has to decide what he's going to do with that power. And you see that in Man of Steel as he's torn between his two fathers and decides to embrace his destiny when he feels the time is right. 
And then as you see in Batman v Superman, that comes with great consequences. That it's a world that really might not have been ready to accept him. And while he's a hero that's doing the best that he can do, there's only so much that he can do. And he's so committed to what he's doing that he will literally give his life for it. And then it's just so exciting when they're able to do this whole re- uh, uh, resurrection arc for him and tell the full death and su- uh, resurrection of Superman storyline in the DCEU. So when he comes back and he shows up and his mind is back, his mind is returned, and he, in that black suit in the finale of Zack Snyder's Superman, it, or Zack Snyder's Justice League. He's Superman. When Superman in the black suit arrives in the finale of Zack Snyder's Justice League, it is so cool. It's so powerful. And it is just everything that you want it to be as he steps in to fully be the hero that can save Earth. The one that was holding back this army as the Kryptonian and he's back to do it once again. And as the character that really has had a three film origin story, complications, death, resurrection, and emerges as the hero again. It's so full, it's so exciting, so he comes in. And Remember, I got more DCEU content coming up over the next few days. If you wanna check out my ranking of all 45 DC films that I did last year, that was a cool video, that was a massive project. You can check that one out right over there if you're a fan of DC films. And if you're looking to have delicious, never frozen meals delivered right to your front door that meet your nutrition needs, the link for Factor is down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.